Well, again, good morning, church. We are, as a church, studying through Mark's gospel. We began two Sundays ago. And this morning, we're continuing in Mark's gospel, looking at the prologue for a final time. So I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles. Turn with me, if you would, to Mark chapter 1, where we will read again verses 1 through 13 but focus on the last two verses, verses 12 and 13. Mark chapter 1, we'll read 1 through 13, but focus on 12 through 13. Would you join me as we stand together for the reading of God's holy, inerrant, and infallible word? Verse 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea was going out to him, and all the people of Jerusalem, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist, and his diet was locusts and wild honey. And he was preaching and saying, After me one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opening, the spirit like a dove descending upon him, and a voice came out of the heavens, you are my beloved son, and you I am well pleased. Immediately, the spirit impelled him to go out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan, and he was with wild beasts, and the angels were ministering to him. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we are so grateful again to be your people and to be gathered together as your people, to set our minds, our attentions, our hearts, our focus upon you. And Father, we know that worship is a dialogue, a dialogue in which we speak to you through prayer, confession, singing, and a dialogue in which you speak to us through your word and through the convicting power of the Spirit. And so Father, Help us to hear what you have to say to us. Before we continue talking about you, give us a heart that are ready to hear from you. We do pray for the one who preaches, Lord. We pray that you would hide him, that he might not in any way block, hide um, your image, your truth, your person, your work, your purposes. We pray, Father, again, that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear, help us to perceive the truth in a world that is filled with error, deception, darkness, lies. We ask, Father, as we've asked so many times this morning, that we would not just be challenged, but changed, not just confronted, but conformed to the image of our Savior. For it is He and He alone that brings you perfect glory and honor. Lord, for us to glorify you, we must be like him. Uh, use this time for that purpose. And we ask these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Last week, we began looking at this section of Mark's gospel, verses 1 through 13, which is the prologue to Mark's gospel. Verses 1 through 13 make up this very unique section of Mark's gospel, the prologue. And prologues, as I said last week, are very important and very unique in all of Holy Writ. Biblical prologues are meant to give us information that prepare us to understand the subsequent story that's to come. And so before Mark launches into the story of Jesus proper, he gives us this prologue. And it is in the prologue that we are given a glimpse behind the scenes. We are taken, as it were, backstage before the drama of Jesus begins to unfold. 
It is in the prologue that we are given information that we wouldn't know apart uh, from the prologue, information that's not evident in the story proper, information that helps us to see the story rightly, to put on the right lens to understand what's taking place throughout the unfolding story. And again, often these themes that appear in prologues don't appear any else, anywhere else in the rest of the story. We're given this backstage information, themes, ideas, concepts that won't reappear in the rest of the story. Last week, I gave you two examples, one from the Old, one from the New Testament of prologues. Just to remind you, for instance, in the Old Testament, we have the book of Job. Job's book begins with a two-chapter long prologue that takes us backstage. And backstage, chapter 1 and 2 of Job, we are taken into the throne room of God, where Satan appears before God, where Satan accuses Job before God, and where God allows Satan to test Job. And then after chapters 1 and 2, the prologue, Satan is never mentioned again. The story of then turns its attention from God's throne room, God and Satan, accusations and temptations to the actual story of Job. And we understand the story of Job because of the prologue. A New Testament example I mentioned last week and again this morning is John's Gospel. The prologue in John's Gospel is 13 verses long, where again we are taken backstage. Taken backstage to, to get, and given a glimpse that we understand the succeeding story. In John's Gospel, the backstage look or the prologue is eternity past where we are taken, according to John's prologue, to the beginning. And in the beginning, we find the, pro, the Logos, who was in the beginning. And the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God, and the Logos is the cause by which all things came into existence. And then we are told in the prologue of John's gospel that the Logos became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld God's glory, the glory of the only begotten, full of grace and truth. And then it turns to the story of Jesus. And we understand John's account of Jesus' life because of the prologue that took us to eternity past. Mark's prologue is just as critical to understand Mark's gospel, Mark's account of Jesus' life. And I said last week, and I remind you today, that Mark's prologue centers around two main concepts. The concept of the spirit in the concept of the wilderness. We dealt with those last week, but by way of reminder, the spirit is held out in terms of understanding who Jesus is and what Jesus' story means. Jesus is that fulfillment of God's repeated and emphasized promise in, in, in the Old Testament, throughout the Old Testament, that a day will come when God will pour out his spirit upon mankind. That promise, according to the Mark's prologue is being fulfilled in the coming of Jesus at last. The promise where the Spirit descends on Jesus, fills Jesus, guides Jesus, empowers Jesus. Jesus will be the, the man of the Spirit. And at last, that fulfillment of God pouring out His Spirit has come to pass in the coming of Jesus. And I said this, and let me say it again. You do realize that apart from the outpouring of the Spirit, you wouldn't be here this morning. You wouldn't know Christ. You wouldn't have just confessed your sins. You wouldn't sing praises to God. Because apart from the Spirit, we remain dead in our trespasses and sins. God poured out His Spirit upon sinners. And that was realized in the coming of Christ. The second main idea or main concept in the prologue is the wilderness. In fact, the entirety, all those verses, 1 through 13 of Mark chapter 1, all take place in the wilderness. It is a wilderness prologue from Isaiah's Old Testament prophecy about a voice crying out in the wilderness to the actual ministry of John, his preaching and his baptizing all taking place in the wilderness. Jesus coming to John for baptism in the wilderness. God's declaration of Jesus as his son in the wilderness. And then ultimately Jesus' temptation by Satan in the wilderness. All of it, all 13 verses unfold in the wilderness. And after the prologue, Mark's gospel, there's no other mention of the wilderness in the rest of Mark's gospel. 
And again, the wilderness represents separation from ordinary life. Jesus in the wilderness engaging the mission that lies ahead of him. The absence of all distractions. It's Jesus, the Father, in the mission in the wilderness. And also that wilderness is a place of threat and deprivation and harshness. And it is in the wilderness amidst all those kinds of ideas that we find the necessity to trust God, to obey God, to depend upon God. The wilderness is a place of purifying, purifying one's dependence and obedience to God. And like ancient Israel in the wilderness, the Son, Jesus, will like them also become hungry and also thirst and also be tempted. But unlike ancient Israel, Jesus will trust God. Again, two main themes in Mark's prologue, the spirit and the wilderness. And those two themes are expressed in the prologue in two main events. They are the baptism of Jesus and the temptation of Jesus. Again, the baptism of Jesus, verses 4 through 11. We have Jesus who has come, God in flesh, who has come to pour out his spirit. And we focused last week on verse 8, where John said this, I baptize you with water, but... He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And here is the idea that Christ will come and what John's baptism with water represented will find fulfillment when Christ, in the final act of redemption, will pour out his Spirit upon sinners. We understand that it is the Spirit that brings us into unity with Christ. We are unified by faith in his active obedience. That's everything that Jesus did to fulfill God's word and plan. His passive obedience, Jesus surrender himself to the plan and purpose of God. We are unified through the spirit to his death, to his burial, to his resurrection, to his ascension, to his, to his uh, uh, glorification. But the final act, the final act that Jesus accomplished in his redeeming mission was to ascend to heaven be glorified and then to pour out his spirit again i baptize you with water but he will baptize you john said with the holy spirit john 3 we are all familiar with it nicodemus and jesus john 3 unless a man be born of the water and of the what spirit he cannot He cannot, universal negative, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Apart from Christ ascending and pouring out his spirit, none of us would be here, and more importantly, none of us will be there. This morning, I want to focus on the second event, which also clearly involves the spirit and the wilderness, and that is the temptation of Christ. Verse 11, or excuse me, verse 12 and 13. Look at it. And immediately the Spirit impelled him to go out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness, 40 days being tempted by Satan. And he was with wild beasts, and angels were ministering to him. Again, as part of the prologue, here we have in the temptation of Jesus another element of the supernatural. The back scenes, the backstage of Jesus' story. In the first event, that is Jesus' baptism, we have supernatural declaration coming from God on high. You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. But here in the second event, the temptation of Jesus, again, more supernatural evidence. The back scene. The backstage. In the second event, the temptation of Jesus, we have the supernatural presence of Satan. We have the supernatural impelling of the Holy Spirit. We have the supernatural ministry of supernatural angels to Jesus. And so it is in the prologue, we again, like in the book of Job, like in John's gospel, are taken behind scene into the unseen world. Backstage into supernatural realities that we are being told in the prologue will continue to exist throughout the entirety of Mark's account of Jesus' life. As you look at Mark's account of Jesus' temptation, verse 12 and verse 13, the most notable thing about Mark's account of Jesus' temptation is this. Ready? 
It's very short. Just two verses. Just two verses. Not a lot of details. Almost no details. There's no dialogue between Satan and Jesus. You don't have Luke and Matthew's explanation or emphasis on the Son of God, i.e. in Matthew and Luke, you have God declaring Jesus to be his son at the baptism. Then in the wilderness with Satan, you have Satan repeatedly asking Jesus the question, if you are the Son of God, then do this. If you are the Son of God, are you really the Son of God? None of those details. Just two verses. No dialogue. No indication in Mark's gospel of what the temptations consisted of. No mention of hunger, no mention of thirst, no stones into bread, no pinnacle of the temple, no high mountaintop temptation, none of that. Just two verses, very short, no details, no details. And when teaching, as a Bible teacher, on a particular passage or text like this this morning, just two verses, sometimes it is very, very important to allow the text to stand by itself. That is to say, to not attempt to import additional information upon the text. To not refer to Luke's account or uh, Matthew's account. To allow the text to stay simply what the text says. And I'm going to suggest to you that although Mark's account is short, only two verses, it is purposely short. Because it is making a point in and of itself. And though it is short, Mark's account is loaded with truth for you and I this morning. In fact, I would say that Mark's little, short, two-verse account of Jesus' temptation really gives us one of the single most important truths in all the world. Not only about the life of Christ, but also about our life. And what we are told in these two verses, two short verses that represent the entirety of Mark's account of Jesus' temptation. As Mark gives us this backstage view of the life of Christ, what we are given in these two verses is what? A conflict. A conflict. A conflict between good and evil. A conflict between Satan, sin, evil, and God. And in this prologue, we are told this because it is this conflict that will characterize the whole of Christ's life. At every turn and in every moment, this conflict will be real. A conflict that will characterize the whole of Christ's life as well as a conflict that characterizes the whole of our lives as Christians. Conflict between good and evil, or better, God and evil. And I want you to notice this, that this conflict will involve both natural and supernatural evil. It did for Jesus and it does for us. This conflict between good and evil involves natural elements of evil and good and not supernatural elements of evil and good. And these elements of good and evil, both in natural form and supernatural form, will persist through the entirety of of Mark's gospel concerning to Jesus. And that's the point of this prologue. And again, it will also persist the entirety of my life and yours. And so in the immediate context, let me state it again, of Mark's gospel, we are being told that at every turn of Jesus' life, he will be in the midst of conflict. Conflict between good and evil, between God and evil, and they will involve both natural and supernatural elements. That's for sure. It's all through Mark's gospel. And Mark, in his account, this short account, purposely short, focuses singularly on the conflict. Conflict between good and evil, both in natural and supernatural form. What does he mean by that? Well, if you look at these two verses, you'll notice that evil is represented. It is represented with the presence of Satan, and it is also represented by the presence of wild animals, wild beasts. Satan, supernatural evil. Wild animals or beasts, natural evil. Good is also represented in this two-verse account. 
It's represented with the presence of the Holy Spirit, and it is represented with the presence of angels ministering to Jesus. And if you pause for a minute and allow this to sink down deep, these two verses, again, are telling us a great and important truth, and that is this, that God exists, but so does evil exist. In two verses, we are thrust with Jesus into a situation in which the very real evidence, God exists, simultaneously the very real evidence that evil exists as well. For many, for many, the fact that evil exists for many is proof that God does not exist. However, in these two verses, we are told that both exist together. That both, yes, God and evil simultaneously exist together. For many in academia, the fact that evil exists is proof that God can't exist, or at least the God of Scripture can't exist. And yet, again, in these two verses, they both exist. This is our worldview. This is where we live. This is how we live our life as believers. We live, or do we not, with a firm conviction and convinced soul that yes, every moment I wake up, every moment I live, yes, both God, all good exists, but so does evil. And it exists profoundly. In fact, in our day, amazing shift has occurred. In the past, unbelievers have battled to prove that God doesn't exist. The shift has occurred, and now that battle has moved to where unbelievers are now trying to prove that evil doesn't exist. Well, evil does exist, and it exists in a deep and profound way. In fact, in our text, if you're taking note, we see three different kinds of evil. Let me categorize these. Evil exists in the world in three kinds of forms or ways. First, we see natural evil. We see natural evil in the existence of a wilderness, a land that has been devastated, land that has been uh, torched and scorched with elements, a, a place that would be a, 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 a impossible to live. In, in, the, in the Hebrew, Desert means devastation. And I remember being in Israel and getting out of a bus and we were with this archaeologist and he took us up on this horizon and he said, there it is. This is the devastation. This is the wilderness that Jesus was tempted in. And we looked out as far as the human eye could see and there was nothing. Natural evil exists. And it exists in these two verses, not only in the form of wilderness, but also with the threat of wild beasts. Different kinds of evil, the first natural evil. You also have in these two verses moral evil, where you look at the word tempt or tempting or temptation. What is that? It is, it is an invocation to violate the word of God, God's authority, God's word, God's sovereignty. This is, this is moral evil. What is sin? Sin is the violation of God's will or word either doing what God's word forbids or not doing what God's word commands. This is moral evil, and that's exactly what Satan was trying to solicit from Jesus, moral evil. Soliciting moral evil amidst natural evil. And then you have a third kind of evil identified in these two verses, and that is spiritual or supernatural evil with the presence of Satan or the devil. Natural evil, a place Beasts, natural evil, supernatural evil, Satan trying to solicit moral evil from Jesus. It's all right here in two verses. And so the temptation of Jesus in Mark's prologue tells us that Jesus will live out in his ministry and mission will take place in an evil world. The story of Jesus will unfold in a dangerous world. 
that Jesus has left the glories of heaven and has come into this world, which is characterized by evil, an evil, dangerous world, a world filled with natural evil and moral evil and supernatural or spiritual evil. This is the world that Jesus has entered. This is the stage that his ministry and life will unfold. And by the way, the world that Jesus came into is the very same world in which you and I live. We live in a world that is dangerous and evil, filled with natural evil, moral evil, spiritual evil. It's everywhere, and it is profound, really profound. Again, look at verse 12 and 13. Immediately, the Spirit impelled him to go out into the wilderness. This wilderness is in some created, uncreated place that's created for a moment. This is our world. Our world still has wilderness. Our world still has Satan. Our world still has wild beasts. <coughs> Let's talk about evil. Let's talk about natural evil. The presence of the wilderness and wild beasts represents a dangerous world. Jesus is being tempted in a dangerous world. A world like ours, same as ours, filled with all kinds of life-threatening realities, filled with danger, filled with things that are seeking to destroy you and I. The wild beasts remind us that the world has been cursed, that our world is no longer the Garden of Eden. And that when God kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden because of sin, he kicked them out of a garden into a dangerous, evil world. Recently, I heard someone refer to a book as being magisterial. So I had to buy it, and I did. The title of the book is The Great Influenza, written by a man named John Barry. It is a truly magisterial work. He writes on all sorts of things that are related, and I'll get to in a second. He writes about the incredible research, with credible research and language, about the development of medicine in America. How in a few, how prior to a certain period of time, medicine in the Americas was barbaric. There was no research, there were no microscopes. They simply looked and tried things. They practiced medicine. And he, he writes about the founding of, of, of an institution, the Hopkins, which became John Hopkins, where these men went to Europe, to Germany, to learn how medicine was actually investigating and studying and learning. And then later he talks about how a virus works. Fascinating. Incredible research. And then he moves to Woodrow Wilson and the advent of World War I. Why? We learn that in 1980, 1918, waterborne fowl infected pigs in a small town in Kansas. And in that town in Kansas were men who had listed for service in order to defend America during World War I. And from Kansas, they went to boot camp and infected boot camp. And from boot camp, they went all over the world and infected the world. The colonel reminded these men, we're sending you out to kill. And then comments, no one had any idea of the breadth of their killing. In the preface to the great influenza, Barry writes, in 1918, an influenza virus emerged probably in the United States that would spread around the world. And one of the earliest appearances in lethal form came in Philadelphia. Before that worldwide pandemic faded in 1920, it would kill more than any other outbreak of disease in human history. Epidemiologists today estimate that the influenza likely caused at least 50 million deaths probably more than 100 million. Normally, influenza chiefly kills the utterly in influence, but in 1918 pandemic, roughly half of those who died were young men and women in the prime of their life in their 20s and 30s. As many as 8 to 10% of all young adults then living uh, may have been killed by this virus. 
The great influenza that hit the United States begins in 1918 and in 24 months an estimated up to as many as 100 million people died. We live in a dangerous world, in an evil world. The virus became so strong that many people died quickly from the sheer trauma that the virus brought to the human body, like on the spot. Some died from secondary effects and pneumonia, but the greatest segment of people died were young people of all things. Young people who had strong immune systems and the virus was so virulent that the human system, human immune systems went into full defense, all out battle against the virus to such a degree that ultimately it was individuals own immune systems that killed them as it tried to fight off the disease. 100 million people died. It began with a virus and some pigs in Kansas. We live in a dangerous world. And as Americans, we, in our culture, encounter coronavirus, and we think this is some, some oddity. No, not at all. He goes on to explain every century, we have two, three major virus encounters that kill People, lots of people, lots and lots of people. Again, we live in a world filled with danger. Jesus entered this world, natural evil. In the last 20 years or more, in 2001, 20,000 people died in a Jugarit earthquake in India. 220,000, 2004, the Indian Ocean t- t- uh, tsunami. 2005, nearly 90,000, Kashmir earthquake, Pakistan. 2010, 300,000 people in Haiti's earthquake, on and on and on and on. We live in a dangerous world. Just in 2020, 5,500 people over died in Europe just from heat wave. Mark says Jesus was with wild beasts. Wild beasts. Every year, mosquitoes kill a million people. Every year, a million people. Every year, 50,000 people die by snake bite. Every year, 25,000 people die being attacked by dogs. And by the way, only 10 people annually die from sharks. However, over half a million people die because of other people. Don't worry about Jaws, worry about your neighbor, amen? (laughs) Natural evil. But that brings me to a second kind of evil, and that's moral evil. Why is death by a human different than death by an animal or a virus? Because death by a human is murder, and murder is a moral evil. Not a natural evil, a moral evil. And again, this is the kind of evil that our culture is trying to deny as evil. Give you an example, ready? Abortion is evil. It's murder. It's moral evil. Again, in these two verses, we're taken back to the beginning of the biblical record, back to the creation account, where we find Satan tempting Eve and ultimately Adam. And in the very beginning, we have the entrance of moral evil, violation of God's word, violation of God's mandates, violation of God's character. And when Adam and Eve sinned, they brought moral evil into this world, and moral evil is so strong, it's everywhere. I'll tell you where it is. It's in me, and it's in you. The Bible says that there is none Good. Remember we're talking about the the conflict between good and evil? There is none, not one, who's good. The Bible says that all the thoughts of our hearts are only evil continually. Natural man. The Bible tells us because of moral evil, our world is characterized by sin and death. Sin and death. Sin and death brought into the world with Satan who tempted the first man, first woman to commit moral evil. 
Satan, who is a fallen angel. Satan, as a fallen angel, is evil. His disposition, fallen angel's disposition, their nature is only evil all the time, and they want us to be like them. Satan is characterized, just listen to these words from Scripture, as what? A liar? That's a moral evil. As a deceiver, moral evil. As a murderer, moral evil. And how pervasive is this evil? 1 John 5, 19 tells us that the whole world lies in the power, listen, of the evil one. Yeah, evil exists. In fact, for us as Christians, our struggle throughout lifetime is against this evil. Ephesians 6, 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against powers, against worldly forces of this darkness, against spiritual forces of weakness in every heavenly place. You and I live in a world where there is unseen evil spiritual from without. There is evil that attacks us from around morally. And there is evil from within. We have evil in ourselves. Evil is from without. Evil is around. Evil is within. And yet, in the midst of this pervasive evil in this world, there is God. There is God. And some people try to excuse God. How can there be an all-good, all-loving, all-knowing, all-powerful God and at the same time be evil? And so what people try to do is they try to create a God who is either not all-loving or not all-knowing or not all-powerful or not all-sovereign in an attempt to somehow rescue God from the issue of evil. I want you to notice verse 12. <coughs> it tells us that immediately after God announcing, declaring, this is my beloved son in whom I will play, immediately, verse 12, immediately the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit impelled him to go into the wilderness. And so from one level of wilderness where he was baptized and where God declared him to be the son, he is impelled by the Spirit of God himself into a, a worse wilderness, a more evil, a more dangerous wilderness than the one in which he was baptized. If you look at verse 12 carefully, this is so important to observe. It says in verse 12 that the Spirit, here, here it is, impelled him. It is the Greek word ekbalo. The spirit ekbalod, impelled him, and it means to be thrown, or to be hurled, or to be cast into the wilderness. Ekbalo. It's the word, the Greek word from which we get the word ballistic. You've heard of a ballistic missile. It is a missile that is impelled, or thrown, or cast, hurled. The word appears many times in the New Testament where Jesus ekbalod demons, cast them out. Or Jesus warned that some unbelievers will be ekbalod, thrown, cast into outer darkness. Or even in the temple, Jesus ekbalod, cast out money changers. He ekbalod those selling doves and so forth in the temple. In verse 12, it is the Holy Spirit who ekbalod Jesus, cast Jesus, threw Jesus, hurled Jesus into the wilderness, into a world in which sheer evil is unmasked before Christ. Unmasked moral evil, unmasked natural evil, unmasked supernatural evil. In our world, evil, Satan, demons are typically clandestine. They hide, they masquerade, they, sh they charade but not in the wilderness for Jesus. No clandestine evil, no veiled evil. It is pure, visible, objective evil that he's confronted with in the wilderness. Just two verses. And again, the real point is don't miss this. It is holy God through his Holy Spirit who casts Jesus into this wilderness. It is an all-loving, all-knowing, all-powerful, all-sovereign God who causes Jesus to be subjected to evil to evil and by the way mark as well as the rest of biblical writers have absolutely no problem with this no problem with god being sovereign 
over all good and no problem with God being sovereign over all evil. The writers of scripture make no attempt to rescue God from what the scriptures declare about God. You understand that? In no way does evil undermine, according to God's word, God's love, God's knowledge, God's power, God's sovereignty. It is the spirit of God himself that casts Jesus into this evil wilderness. Mark your place in Mark chapter 1 for a minute. Uh, A self-declaration from God about this subject. Look at Isaiah chapter 45. An intense self-declaration from God about himself. Isaiah 45. And as you're turning there, not only do the writers of scripture have no intention of rescuing God from his sovereignty over good and evil. The writer of scriptures don't do that, but Isaiah 45, beginning of verse 5, neither does God himself. Notice beginning of verse 5, God says this, I am the Lord and there is none other. There is no other besides me, there is no God. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that men may know from the rising to the setting of the sun, that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord. There is no other. The one, listen to this, forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity. I am the Lord who does all these. Is God sovereign over good? We're quick to say yes. Is God sovereign over evil? We should be just as quick to say yes. While God is not the author of evil, God does choose to allow, use evil. The Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 3, God, from all eternity, did by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeably ordain, listen, Whatsoever comes to pass, whatever, yet so, as thereby neither is God the author of sin, nor is violence offered to the will of his creatures, nor is the liberty uh, or contingency of second causes taken away, but rather established. What does that mean? God from all eternity, according to his own most wise and holy counsel, according to his own will, ordains everything that takes place, good and evil. And though God is not the author of evil, he does not prevent people from being evil. He does not prevent second causes from being or bringing evil, i.e. Satan, demons, people, sharks, virus, politicians, Hitlers, you name it. But his sovereignty establishes it. And the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 3, goes on to say all of it to the praise of his glorious grace, all of it to the praise of his glorious justice. The writers of Scripture don't try to excuse God, nor does God himself. He is sovereign over all good. He is sovereign over all evil. The Spirit impels, cast Jesus into unmitigated evil because it is in the midst of the evil that Jesus, here it is, righteousness and glory is even more righteous and more gloriously seen. God allows evil so that his holiness becomes even more evident. And that is that not the point of Mark's account of Jesus' temptation? Two verses, what do you see? You see the wilderness and evil. And on the other hand, you see what? You see Jesus. You see Jesus. I'm going to teach you a verse right now. Ready? It's Romans 3, 5. It says this, Our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God. Our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God. You think you got it? Say it with me. Our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God. Romans 3, 5. Picture the cross in your mind. 
picture. Do you see the unrighteousness of men? Do you? Do you see it in cruelty and injustice, violence, lies, the politics that led to it, hatred, murder, contempt? Do you see evil when you look at the cross? On the other hand, do you see the righteousness of God in the cross? Not only the loving, saving, emptying, willing, surrendering, paying, innocent, holy, forgiving Jesus, but also a righteous God who cannot but demand that the consequence of unrighteousness, of sin, must be satisfied, even if it costs him his son. And it is in the cross where you see evil, real evil. And it is against the backdrop of that real present evil, the worst kind of evil. I can't think of anything more evil than crucifying the Son of God. It is in the midst of that deep, depraved evil that what? The glory of God, God shines brighter than anywhere else in all the world in history. Our unrighteousness, Romans 3, 5, demonstrates the righteousness of God. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, 23, Jesus was delivered over by the de predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. And you nailed to the cross, listen to this, by the hands of godless men and put him to death. God caused godless men to commit the greatest of all human evils. Why? For his own glory. Our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God. How much more does Satan's unrighteousness in this wilderness scene demonstrate the righteousness of God? We have pitted against each other Satan, evil, God, and Jesus Christ, glorious, and it is a contrast extraordinary. Again, two verses, God exists profoundly, and evil exists profoundly. God is the God that Scripture reveals as who he is. The scripture is God's own self-revelation, and the Scriptures tell us that God is absolutely sovereign. He controls everything. He created everything. He is sovereignly uh, ruling over everything, over, over every minute detail. Nothing happens in this world what we would deem as good and what we would deem as evil apart from God's own self-determined purposes. Scriptures tell us that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, everything in this earth, is God's. 1 Chronicles 29 says this, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above it all. Thou reignest over it all, and thine hand is power and might, and thy hand is to make great and give strength. Here's one for you. Psalm 115.3 says this, our God is in the heavens, and he does whatever he pleases. And some people, again, really struggle with the idea of a God who is in control of all, all things, absolutely, completely sovereign, over good and over evil. They struggle. That's a difficult concept. I'll give you a more difficult concept. How about the idea of a God that isn't in control of all things? What does that leave you with? A God who isn't a God. Deuteronomy 32, 39, see now that I, I am he, and there is no God besides me. It is I who put to death and give life. I have wounded, and it is I who heal, and there is no one who can deliver, deliver from my hand. God does what he chooses to do. He does whatever he pleases. Thank God he's sovereign over all. Thank God that he really is God. There's not an atom in this universe that's not in his control. If, if there was, as Sproul said, there would be universal anarchy in the universe. God is God. 
And I want him to be God. And I want him to be God over coronavirus. I want him to be God over disease and death. Someday when I hear I've got cancer, I want him to be God over my cancer, over my death. Don't you? God is sovereign over evil. And that's why the Spirit threw, cast Jesus into the wilderness. Why? Because there was no doubt he was coming out victorious. That's why he came. And in the wilderness, though it's not said, it's going to be evidenced, isn't it? Where you will see Jesus as the story of Jesus unfolds in Mark's gospel as victorious over all evil. Natural evil, winds, waves, no problem. Moral evil, no problem. Satan and demons, no problem. Jesus is God who is sovereign over all things, over evil, so much so that one day God's cause of evil in this world will cease and we will end up by his grace in a new heaven and a new earth in which only righteousness will dwell. Hallelujah. <laughs> you can say that again and again. By the way, we live in an evil, dangerous world. Make no mistake about it. You can't hide from it. You can't insulate yourself. You can't retreat from it. It's what it is. And it's God's will for us to be here. It's God's will for us to be present amongst evil, light in an evil, salt in an evil world. I'm not trying to preserve my life. You're not here to preserve your life. You're here to spend your life, use your life, give your life in an evil world for the glory of God. We're stewards. We're stewards. And you can do all the preserving and all the vaxxing and everything else you want in this world. And I'm going to tell you, so, listen, when it's time for you to go, you're going. <laughs> Amen? Amen? And if you're a Christian, let me tell you, eye has not seen nor ear heard, nor has it ever entered the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him. It's only going to get better. Let's pray together. Father, I've been told and have heard that Christians in suffering evil places pray for and worry about the Western church, particularly the American church, because we've been insulated and isolated from the harsh realities of evil. They worry and pray to you Father, that we've not counted the cost of sacrifice, not counted the cost of discipleship, not carried the cross and followed Jesus, that we're soft and lazy and opulent and self-centered, seeking the easy path, the comfortable path. Father, iron sharpens iron. We often apply that to people, but it is the difficulties in this world, it is the trials, as James says, says that, tastes, that tests our faith and brings about proven character in us as believers. Father, you're sovereign, I'm not. Father, you know I'm not a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but the signs of the time would tell us that we as a nation and as a people and as a church are about to say goodbye to what we have known in terms of ease and comfort, prosperity, freedom. Evil is about to unleash itself and, re and raise its head like never before. There's no question. And Father, we fear, I fear for my kids, I fear for my grandkids as do many here today. But as we see in your word in just these two verses, you have given us, as you did Jesus, the spirit, the comforter, the guide, the enabler. And you have unleashed in an unseen world angels that minister and care, that lift us up. 
And we are reminded in this text that you are sovereign over it all. That nothing can or will ever befall our lives that didn't first pass through nail-scarred hands. Father, I pray particularly for the person here who doesn't know Christ, Lord. Draw them to the gospel. Draw them to Jesus. May the Spirit of God open their eyes, soften their hearts, help them to believe and to trust, to call out upon Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, confess their sins. God, help them to be saved. Help them to be yours. Help them to have hope in this dangerous, evil world. Uh, Father, you've called the church uh, to be a militant church. That is, a church engaged in battle. And uh, we have to recognize the enemy, the challenge, the opposition, the struggle, the sweat and the toil to fulfill that. Uh, we pray that you would help us to do that as your people. Uh, it is my conviction, I believe, Father, according to your spirit and your world, that according to your spirit and your word, that um, maybe like never before in our history, uh, have we encountered as Christians, the church encountered a world that is so militantly and fastly evolving into unmitigated evil, violating everything that you demand and commanded, established, sinning against nature itself, redefining terms that have been established since the beginning, the audacity of evil. And we can, under the pressures of this world, Father, apart from your grace, cave in and comply, go along. Uh, but it will be to our demise and to our world's demise. And so, God, we ask you for your grace. And even as we approach this table, help us to feed upon Jesus, that we might be your distinct people, committed to the end, like the prophets who stood against the the, the false prophets of Baal wouldn't bend a knee, wouldn't concede. God, vindicate us and use us. We ask these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. My brothers and sisters, may our gracious Lord bless you and keep you. May our saving Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May our Lord lift you up into his countenance and give you peace. Amen. Amen.